Hi, everyone, and welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect, the Van Trump Report, the Yield Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. I'm Eva Tucker with iSelect Fund, and I'm excited to welcome you all to our discussion today. Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, including emerging topics such as soil health, plant genetics, vertical farming, and aquaculture, to name a few. This month's theme is aquaculture, and on today's call, we are joined by Eric and Otam, CEO and co-founder of This Fish. This Fish is an emerging leader in seafood traceability software that improves business efficiency while also increasing trust and transparency in seafood supply chains. Today, most of us are disconnected from the sources of our seafood. This fish, the, the, the This Fish platform brings end consumers closer to their food by tracing its journey back to its origins, who caught it, when, where, and how, in order to help shoppers make better informed choices about the authenticity, quality, and sustainability of the seafood they eat. Its mission is to improve the social, environmental, and financial sustainability of the seafood industry. Each of you knows companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in this fish's market. You are potential customers for this fish's products and services. You have built a company similar to this fish's, or you are a sophisticated business person or agricultural professional who understands the market and the challenges and opportunities they may face. Before we get started, we have a quick poll question to better get a better idea who, of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. And a few process comments while the poll is running. We are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help this fish find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You are all on mute. You can use the chat window to ask a question at any time. This, question, this presentation is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further, today, without further delay, I'm pleased to introduce Eric Eno Tam, CEO of This Fish. Great, thanks uh, Eva. And I'll just uh, share my screen here to get into my, uh, my presentation. Great, uh, thank you very much. So I'm uh, I'm Eric Enotam, based uh, in Vancouver, Canada, is where our uh, our startup is based. So um, today, I'm, what I'm going to do in my presentation is kind of give you a bit of background about some of the the challenges in the global seafood supply chain. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, us as a company, and we we focused uh, very much on one part of the supply chain that I'll I'll tell you a little uh, a little bit about. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, our company's approach to, to AI. Uh, so I've been in the seafood industry for, for most of my life. Um, and uh, I know some of you on the, on the call may have questions outside of, you know, kind of the parameters of our company. We're not an aquaculture company, uh, but we, you know, I, I've seen a lot of tech in the aquaculture space. Uh, also wild capture fisheries. So I definitely uh, entertain questions you know that go beyond our, our kind of company's core core competencies. So, um, yeah. So uh, to start off, you know, we we all like to kind of romanticize uh, the seafood industry that uh, you know that well worn tale of of the old man in the sea. And while there's certainly some truth to that story, it's equally true that seafood is actually the most globally uh, traded protein on Earth. Uh, the, uh, the industry is massive, industrial, uh, and complex. But the actual information systems running the global supply chains are, are incredibly uh, archaic. Most of the data is trapped on paper ledgers, you know, paper forms, graph paper, e even scraps of paper. Uh, this is the paperwork from uh, just one day's production from a Thai tuna cannery. Uh, so you can see there, there's uh, over four inches of paperwork. So I, I sort of joke that uh, the industry is drowning in, in paperwork and it kind of uh, reminds me of the, uh, the poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, you know, data, data everywhere, but not a, not a drop to sink. So, you know, our mission as a company is really to help bring this ancient industry 
uh, into the into the digital age. Uh, I mean, you know, fishing uh, is really one of the last vestiges of our early hunter gatherer society. And the reason we're doing that is because if you actually knew where your seafood came from, this may be your reaction. Uh, you know, illegal fishing, seafood fraud, you know, even uh, slave labor. These are a lot of the challenges that are plaguing the global industry. But over the last 10 years, there's been a growing movement uh, calling for electronic traceability in our supply chains uh, to increase the accountability and, and transparency for social and environmental purposes. Uh, and tra traceability is obviously critical and 50 of the largest um, NGOs and retailers uh, and tuna retailers came together with the uh, Tuna 2020 Traceability de Declaration committing to full uh, traceability in, in global supply chains. But in such an industry that's so massive and complex, I mean, there are literally millions of fishing vessels and fish farms on one side and then millions of restaurants and retailers on the other. So where do you start when you wanna digitize the industry? Well, actually in the middle, there's only about 50,000 seafood processing plants in, engaged in global trade. So in our view, this is the most critical node in the supply chain because it's ultimately the, uh, the data data bottleneck. So at this fish, what we've done is developed software that allows the uh, seafood manufacturing sector to digitize and automate all of their production quality control and traceability data using tablet computers and, and IoT devices. And so what's gonna really drive adoption of technology, of our technology, talk, technology in general in the industry? Well, I mean, market and regulatory demand for traceability is certainly one driver. And actually last week, um, uh, Japan passed a law making it illegal to import illegal seafood into the country and requiring higher levels of document documentation and traceability that's actually more in line with uh, laws in the United States and the EU. So the big three seafood markets, the EU, United States, and Japan, Japan was kind of offside with very little traceability. They've now really, they're now starting to come onside. So you're gonna see mounting pressure uh, globally, especially as uh, Japan starts to operationalize their, uh, their new law. Um, but the other, the other driver of the technology adoption is really uh, about efficiency, about cost control and compliance and about making better, better business sense. So in terms of like the value proposition for our software, you know, the digitization and automation really kind of cuts costs, mostly labor costs in just managing the data. Uh, we have real time dashboards that improve, uh, strengthen the, the monitoring and control uh, inside the factory. And that's really about uh, managing material costs. Because if you're not watching your quality in production, uh, and if you miss specifications and you have to downgrade product from like a, a European market down to a local Latin American market, you know, you can, that can have huge economic implications for the company. Uh, of course, the electronic traceability really kind of is the backbone of our software and, and improves the compliance reporting. Uh, you know, in terms of our kind of business model, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We're, we're a SaaS software company, and basically the monthly SaaS fee really kind of scales with the, the size and complexity uh, of your processing plant. So we have we have customers even as small as, as $500, $500 or $5,000 a year, and upwards of $65,000 to $75,000 a year. It's a quite a fragmented uh, global market with a lot of different uh, scale of operation. Uh, the total available market, um, by my calculation, in, in, in terms of the SaaS fees that we would charge based on the, uh, the composition and the size of the industry is about just over uh, $600 million. Um, I would say that about half of those, uh, plant, half of those plants are, are sellable, they're at a scale that they would be willing to maybe buy software within the next five years. So that brings it down to about $300 million and a 30% market share of that would be a total um, uh, serviceable obtainable market, a SOM of you know, just under uh, 100 million US dollars. You know, in terms of competition in, in the space, 
This is a greenfield. Uh, this is largely a greenfield industry. So paper and Microsoft Excel uh, are actually our big competitors. Uh, and they're pretty tough competitors. I mean, you know, paper's been around for a couple thousand years and Microsoft Excel, I guess, since the 1990s. Uh, and they're deeply embedded in the processes in most companies. Um, and for, I'll give you an example. Um, seafood cost accounting is extremely complex, so complex that a lot of companies don't do their cost accounting in their ERP or accounting software. They'll do it on Microsoft Excel. So it's a, you know, Excel's a pretty powerful tool. Uh, in the North American market, I would say that there are some legacy providers, uh, you know, technologies based on Microsoft Dynamics, um, some pro pro other proprietary. There's some software in the general food processing space that they kind of sell into the seafood space. But for us as a company, you know, most of these uh, software aren't really designed for the seafood sector, uh, which means that they have to be customized, which adds cost and complexity. So we can really come in uh, with a, uh, a much lower uh, cost and much less complexity than uh, most of our competitors. A couple other things, some of these legacy softwares, especially Dynamics, not very user friendly. We're a modern stack. I kind of like to say we're kind of the, the slack of seafood processing. Uh, we know there's a lot of low skilled workers in, in, in seafood manufacturing, but probably food manufacturing in general. Uh, so a lot of the factories that are used our software in Southeast Asia, they use a lot of migrant workers from Laos or Cambodia. Um, in Latin America, you know, it's a lot of uh, low paid uh, workers. So we've developed a very simple and, and easy to use interface. Um, you know, in terms of our, our customer base, we, we are a startup, we're a new company. So we have uh, 14 customers, they're scattered globally, um, which kind of has really um, allowed us to test our thesis that we could scale our software across a global fra fragmented marketplace. Uh, and we also have a couple of channel partnerships in Thailand, Vietnam, uh, and, uh, and New Zealand. And I'm just signing uh, an NDA to get into discussions with the channel partner uh, in, in Mexico. Um, the two areas that we're really focusing on are uh, Latin America and Southeast Asia, because these are the big tuna producing and shrimp producing areas uh, in, the, in the world. Just in terms of the configurability and scalability, this is, for instance, what we call a data stream map that shows uh, all the data collection stations in a, in a tuna factory. So we have, currently have the two largest uh, tuna uh, producers in Ecuador are our customers. They uh, account for, or to, uh, I should say, uh, Ecuador is the second largest tuna, produ tuna can producing country in the, in the world. Uh, and the amount of data is pretty enormous. Um, one of the companies, they are collecting over 1500 variables uh, and we expect that they'll probably get about uh, eight, eight to nine gigabytes uh, of data uh, a year. As I mentioned, our target focus is really in Latin America and Southeast Asia. These are the big tuna and shrimp producing uh, regions of the world. Of course, we do have some customers in Canada and the United States and, and we'll continue to focus a bit on those uh, in Q1 and Q2 of, of next year, just because of COVID and, and some of the travel restrictions. So it was about a year ago that we actually started to do uh, research on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and uh, uh, that's because our software is collecting large data sets. And uh, seafood is sort of a, you know, presents almost a perfect, seafood processing presents almost a perfect problem to be solved by artificial intelligence. And the reason for that is because there's a lot of natural variability in, in especially wild caught seafood. I would say, you know, much more variability than even in terrestrial agriculture. Uh, I mean, things are just uncontrollable. And because of those numerous variables, um, it's often very difficult for seafood manufacturers to predict production and quality control outcomes because they don't know necessarily the nature of the raw material that's coming in and especially how it's treated on board the vessel. So that's kind of a perfect problem for machine learning when there's so many variables that the human mind can't comprehend how to predict what the outcome is going to be. You stick those variables into a machine learning al algorithm and you can get pretty high prediction rates. And with a tuna cannery in Bangkok, uh, we took their, that was our first customer, uh, a company called MMP uh, International. 
Uh, they do about 120 metric tons of raw material a day. They collect about 700 variables in the software, about two gigabytes a year. So the this factory is a bit smaller than the Ecuadorian factories. And what we found is the data is extremely clean. I mean, which you, you would expect because this is food processing data. Uh, we better hope that all the food quality uh, data is very clean because uh, you know food safety depends on it. So we analyzed this data and we came out with extremely strong predictions. So we could predict the yields coming out of the factory based on some raw material and other process control uh, process control variables. So what we're really doing is doubling down on what our tally software is good at, and that is basically trying to get more value out of the out of the original data capture in our, in our software. So actually today, um, Canada's Minister of Fisheries and Minister of Innovation actually announced uh, a 500 million, or sorry, $500,000 uh, grant to our company uh, for us to invest in the next generation of seafood processing technology powered by AI. So um, what we're gonna be developing is what we're calling small uh, tally bots. And I, they're sort of like digital helpers. I kind of like to call them the R2D2 of seafood processing. And they're little AI enabled apps that we're gonna embed in our software for process automation and predictive analytics. And that could be things like matching raw material to final product based on specifications and yield outcomes. Uh, it could just be simple air prediction so that the factories can ca catch errors as they're happening in, in real time. Uh, other process control, especially in the canneries, drain weight predictions. So trying to get a better handle on what the actual final drain weight of a can would be. And uh, if you're from California, you might know about a large scale class action suit against the tan, uh, can tuna industry uh, because they were under packing their cans and it, they got into a massive class action lawsuit. So with the technology, what we can do is better predict uh, what the actual drain weight of the can will be. So these are some of the research projects that we're now working on in partnership with uh, two of Canada's top universities, York University and McGill, uh, two salmon processors here in, in uh, Vancouver uh, and British Columbia, and Eurofish, which is the second largest uh, canned tuna producer in, uh, in, in Ecuador. Um, I also should mention that, you know, a couple years ago, we did raise a, a pre-seed round as part of uh, Techstar Sustainability, which was done in, in partnership with the Nature Conservancy. Uh, in British Columbia, we were named one of uh, BC's top 10 startups this year. And we also made it into uh, the long list uh, top 10 uh, food tech companies uh, nominated by uh, Robobank. You know, in terms, of, in terms of our team, we have a very multicultural team. We actually have 10 staff uh, and uh, nine countries represented amongst our staff. So we're a very global company. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we have a group of us uh, on product and uh, data science uh, who are based here in Vancouver. Uh, you know, Canada has a very, very uh, favorable uh, research and development tax credit. It's a refundable one. So 65% uh, of the money we spend on AI will get back uh, through a tax credit, which is why we keep a lot of our R&D research here in Vancouver. Uh, our head of systems engineering is based out of Lima, Peru. Uh, we also have a head of our customer support based in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, and we also have some staff in Ecuador and uh, and uh, the Philippines. Again, these are big, some of our big uh, tuna markets. You know, as for myself, actually, I was, I was born and raised in a, a commercial fishing family uh, on Vancouver Island in, in Canada's uh, North Pacific. Um, that really goes back generations. Um, so, you know, I've been in the industry most of my life and have been managing technology and industry for well over, over 10 years building out that initial traceability platform that Eva talked about, and now this new manufacturing software. So, you know, at, at this fish, I kind of really see ourselves as kind of the next generation, sort of passionately building uh, a more data-driven future for, for sustainable seafood. Great, so, so that's, the, uh, that's the end of the, uh, the presentation. I could open it up to questions and I'll just put up the last slide. You know, if any of you would like to reach out to me afterwards, to chat about the industry, uh, I'd be I'd be really happy to uh, to take your calls or have a, an, an email exchange. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. That was really interesting. Appreciate you sharing with us. Um, 
for to the audience, uh, you can ask a question by using the Q&A box found in the middle of the screen, or you can raise your virtual hand uh, and I will unmute you and you can ask your question out loud. So we'll give a few minutes for people to submit their questions. Um, in the meantime, I'll, I'll start us off. So um, COVID's taking a toll on the seafood industry since something like 70% of seafood is consumed out of the house. So we're interested in understanding how COVID's affecting your business and or your long-term outlook. Yeah, so um, I mean, it's definitely, it's affected our business in, you know, I, I think uh, in three ways. One, the uncertainty of, of COVID, um, you know, I think early on froze up capital budgets at, at companies, right? So, I mean, I think that's true just globally that, you know, when the pandemic hit and there was a lot of uncertainty, people aren't just going out and starting uh, capital projects. So that was certainly true, although we, we're starting to see uh, that change now as I think companies realize that going digital and, and having more remote oversight uh, of your operations could be actually an, an advantage during, uh, during a pandemic. So I think that, you know, the silver lining for us is that, you know, I think it could help to drive market demand. Uh, I also think that there's renewed interest in transparency around supply chains uh, because of, of the pandemic. Uh, the other, of course, big challenge is just travel. I mean, with very small factories, we can do a, a remote installation. We are a software company, so most of the hardware is is basically off the shelf. I mean, you know, you could hire a local IT person uh, to basically set up, you know, a, a label printer or a barcode scanner or something like that. Um, but from bigger factories, we do have to be on site. So the Eurofish uh, that I mentioned, uh, we actually did the on-site installation at the big end of August and September. So I actually had to try, travel down to, to Ecuador. Um, but, you know, many, in terms of protocols, being in the factory, uh, you know, it's a tuna facility. So the hygiene and food safety is quite high. So everybody wears PPE even before the, the pandemic. Um, so that, you know, that wasn't a, a big, necessarily a big deal. And then the third way is actually it has affected our customers. So, you know, the, the canned tuna market is exploding. Thai Union, which is the world's biggest producer of canned seafood, had their most profitable quarter during the pandemic. Uh, they do a lot of shelf-stable product and demand is just driven through the roof. Uh, so the canneries that we're working with are doing extremely well. However, you know, we also have uh, the second largest producer of frozen lobsters in Belize. Most of those lobsters are being sold to Darden for into red lobster. So, you know, the demand for lobster uh, at restaurants has collapsed. Uh, prices in the, uh, the Belizean uh, lobster industry have collapsed. That's been very problematic. You know, one of our other customers is a, a, dis, a lobster distributor out of Australia, going mostly into the Chinese market. So they were very early on affected. They basically shut down operations, I think December, January last year, and they started up again in September. So it's been really lumpy. Um, you know, there are some customers as well that if they were selling to food, uh, to food service, they just switched uh, and, you know, start to sell more into retail. And some of the smaller companies, I would say in, in North America here are also starting to do uh, direct to consumer. So I see that like typical, like uh, there's one San Francisco company that contacted me. They were mostly selling into wholesale and to restaurants, food service, maybe a bit of retail. And now they've pivoted and they set up direct to consumer. So you start to see a lot of, of that happening as well. Thanks for sharing. So um, another question, what type of ROI do customers typically see from adopting a software like this? Yeah, so I mean, the, so, some of the ROI calculations are, are still fairly new for, for us uh, just because, you know, uh, they haven't been, you know, they haven't necessarily been operational um, uh, that long. I would say that you, there, are, as, there are three things. It's really the compliance, the cost, and the, um, and, and the control. Uh, and it varies depending on the marketplace. So I'll give you an example. Uh, the Ecuadorian tuna sector, EU regulators went to Ecuador last year and they uh, basically did an, an audit of the industry and they called out the industry for a lack of traceability, particularly in the processing of tuna. 
uh, and they got a yellow card. And if, uh, if Ecuador doesn't improve their traceability on the tuna, the EU will then bring up a red card and will ban uh, tuna imports from Ecuador. And, and the EU is, is uh, Ecuador's largest um, uh, you know, market. So the Ecuadorian companies have really, you know, looked at that and they want to improve their compliance to EU regulations. So, you know, in terms of the IR ROI for them, it's continued market access, improving the traceability. And then there are some, you know, some gains to be made out of labor saving just because so much data is manually inputted. Um, so in places like Southeast Asia and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and Ecuador where, where labor is less, I would say it's less a cost driver and more of a compliance driver. Uh, I think in North America here where salaries are much higher, it's more around the control and the, and the cost thing in, in, in the factory. So I'll give you one example in, in Alaska, uh, a company was, you know, they were using mostly Mexican migrant workers, but they were still getting paid quite a bit of money because they were on a remote island in Alaska the cost of labor was $30 an hour. Um, but what they found is, is that they were overstuffing their shipping containers by 10%. Uh, so the company estimated they were losing uh, about uh, half a million dollars a year because they were overstuffing the shipping containers. They only figured it out because some of the shipping containers would come to their own, old, their own cold storage down in Seattle. And they would realize that all of those were overstuffed by 10%. So they figured that they were overstuffing, you know, the stuff going directly to Korea or Japan from Alaska. So when they brought in our software, uh, that basically ended. So they saved a half a million dollars. Uh, they pay us about uh, $20,000 in software licensing fees uh, a year. So, you know, they got a, a you know, over, you know, a, a 10X um, on their, uh, you know, on the software. Uh, because of the because fixing those mistakes and in fact they told me that they thought our software recorded the the volume in the containers better than even the cold storage facility in in Seattle so they were really able to tighten up their process control interesting it seems like there's a lot of different ways people can get ROI exactly it, and, and when I go talk to a customer that's the first thing I do is like where's your problem and like the shipping container one was the first one that jumped out for this Alaskan company, right? Uh, it's a huge, it was a huge problem. So how do you see your product evolving? Are there any features that you wish you could implement today? Yeah, so, the, the, you know, there are a lot of photographs uh, taken with quality control. I think this is generally in food processing. So you know, when you receive raw material into your factory, you, you want to take some photographs to document the quality of it, particularly if, if it's poor quality. In production as well, you know, photographs are often taken. Uh, and then even when you're stuffing a shipping container, most companies for security reasons, every row of boxes they put into the container, they take photos of uh, and have a full documentation of the container before it's shipped. So, you know, we've recently just put in uh, the ability to basically put in photos. Uh, and then as we build out all the photos in the software, uh, we can use image recognition and AI to maybe make predictions. So around, well, I'll give you an example uh, in British Columbia here with a salmon processor, color and gaping uh, in the fillets, you know, a quality control person could just take a photo and this, the, the, uh, the software will automatically categorize the quality of the color, the, the amount of gaping and, and that sort of thing. So that's kind of where we're, we're, we're focused uh, more onto image recognition uh, and using those, uh, the photos for you know, predictive, predictive analytics. So that's, some, some, that's one area that we're sort of focusing on. Great. So just a reminder to the audience, um, if you'd like to ask a question, drop it in the Q&A box. But we have one final question that we like to ask, and that is, how can the what can, how can the audience help you out here, and how can they find you? Um, yeah, so I mean, I um, my uh, email is pretty simple. It's if you want to reach out, it's uh, Eric E R I C at this dot fish or T H I S dot F I S H. Yeah, and if you uh, you know, obviously, if you're an investor, um, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you. 
if you're in the general food processing industry, even outside of seafood, uh, you know, I'm always looking to talk with uh, other businesses uh, who are in parallel industries. We're very focused in on seafood, but our software is pretty agnostic. So, you know, I have talked with, you know, Cargill's turkey plant in the Southern US uh, and other food commodities, because a lot of the processing is, has similar workflows. So I, you know, I am curious to talk to people outside the seafood industry as well and see whether there might see, be some applicability to some of our ideas and technology and in parallel food verticals. Well, thank you, Eric, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Congratulations, Eric, on all of your progress to date. Um, we wanna let people know that we host these calls every Thursday at 3 p.m. Central. You can register for them at agrifoodconversations.com. Uh, we also post, send out the replays uh, to everybody that's registered and post on YouTube. Uh, we will be taking a break the next two weeks because the Thursdays fall on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. So, so our next Agrifood Conversation will be January 7th. So we hope everyone enjoys the holiday season. And um, thank you again, Eric. Have a great day. Great. Thank you. Take care.